Well, hello, Christian Academy. Dr. Shell here. And I want to talk to you about some more things that happen in the life of Jesus after the resurrection. Um, we talked about the fact that after the resurrection, Jesus was on earth for uh, quite a while, meeting with his disciples, appearing to people, teaching, and then he went up into heaven. And we, that is called the ascension. Ascension is just a fancy name that means to go up. And so uh, 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus was ascended. And sometimes I wonder, oh, oh, you're probably wondering about the background here. Uh, where is Waldo? Do you ever play that? Do you ever use that book, that the book that has all those crazy drawings? And you have to try to find Waldo in all of those drawings and it's all confusing and there's so much you look for his red and white uh, striped shirt but there's so much red and white going on it's so it's hard to find the old boy uh, now you can stop looking because actually he's in the part of the picture that's right behind me so you can't find him so I knew you'd be distracted and you'd be trying to find him in the background but you can't he's actually right behind me so uh, but where's Waldo is reminds me that sometimes when we think about Jesus, we want to know, well, where is he? Right? We believe that he came back from the dead. We believe that he's not in the tomb, but where is he? Where is he right now? And so I thought we would just spend a little time talking about that. We're going to read uh, several scriptures today. Um, the book of Acts, which was written by uh, Luke. Um, did you know, a little fun fact, that Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And if you put them together, Luke actually wrote most of the New Testament. He wrote more than Paul. He, he wrote the majority of the New Testament when you put Luke and Acts together. Now, in Acts, um, one of Jesus' disciples, right before the uh, uh, ascension, they asked him, now, is this when the kingdom of God is going to come? And Jesus said, no, the kingdom of God is not yet. It's not for you to worry about. Then he says this, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After Jesus said these things, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going away, also there were sitting, they were staring toward heaven. Suddenly, two men in white robes stood next to them, and they said, Galileans? Why are you standing here looking toward heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So the angels told the apostles that Jesus not only ascended, but one day he's going to descend. He's going to come back. But until then, we've got work to do to go and tell the good news to everybody. I'm going to jump over to uh, Mark's gospel. Uh, Mark's gospel is short and sweet. Everything in the gospel of Mark is short and sweet. Uh, I love the gospel of Mark. He's just, he's busy, busy, busy. And it's it's just right to the point. Uh, here's Luke, Mark's gospel, the very end of the gospel of Mark, chapter 16. After the Lord Jesus spoke to them, he was lifted up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. That's it. He was taken up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. Ah, so now we have the answer to the question. Where is Jesus? Jesus is at the right hand of God. Now, there's two things that are important about the idea of the right hand of God. First of all, it symbolizes a place of honor. Um, Maybe you've gone to fancy dinners or maybe weddings where there's like little place cards that tell everybody where they get to sit. And when you do that, you're putting people in particular places. And so everybody, of course, wants to sit next to uh, the person of honor, whether it's the bride and the groom or if it's a retirement dinner. People want to sit close to the, the person who is important. And so that place, that place right at their right hand, because most people are right-handed. Now, I'm left-handed, so it kind of hurts my feelings a little, but that's okay. The, the most honored place is right there at the right hand of God, and that's where Jesus is sitting. The other thing, the fact that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God is sort of an indication that he's done. 
He did the work. He came to earth. He was born in the manger. He grew up. He was a great teacher. He performed miracles. He died on the cross for our sins. Then he came back to life, and then he went up into heaven, and now he is seated at the right hand of God. He's done. He did his work, and he's finished. So the idea that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, maybe your mom or dad comes in from a hard day's work, and maybe they have a special chair they like to plop on and be like, whoo, to let you know that they're done with the hard day's work. Maybe you're like that. You throw your backpack down and you have a special place you like to plop down and maybe you get out your video games or something that you just go to your room and you just, this is your place where you crash. And Jesus has just crashed at the right hand of God to symbolize that he's finished. He did the good work of saving us from our sin. But there's even more. In fact, that phrase, the right hand of God, is repeated over and over and over in the New Testament. And I want to look at two more passages. Hang with me this morning. I know I usually don't read this much scripture, but this is an interesting thing. Where is Jesus right now? He's at the right hand of God to symbolize that he has authority and power, to symbolize that he is finished. But what else is he doing? Well, I want to read you the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. Are you taking notes? Romans chapter 8 in verse 33. Paul is talking about our salvation and the fact that even... Even though we are saved, sometimes we still sin. We still disobey God. And Paul says, well, what about that? What about people who point their finger and say, wait a minute, I thought you were a child of God. Look, you're, you're sinning, you're doing wrong. You must not be a child of God. Ah, but this is where Paul comes in and he tells us in Romans 8, 33 and following. Who will bring a charge against God's special people? It is God who acquits them. That means when you say somebody's innocent. It is God who acquits them, like in a court of law. Who is going to convict them? Well, it is Jesus Christ who died, even more, who was raised, who is also at God's right hand. It is Christ who also pleads our case. So, Jesus isn't just sitting there in the right hand chair next to God, just chilling out, doing nothing. He is actually pleading our case. It, Paul almost envisions like a court, and they're bringing us in, and they're saying, you're a sinner, even though you Jesus died on the cross for you. And God is the judge, and it's almost like a trial. It's a court case. But they look over to Jesus, and he's seated right there at the right hand of God, and he's pleading our case. He's whispering to the judge, forgive him. I've already forgiven them. I've already quitted them. I've already taken away their sin. They're innocent. So Jesus, while he's there at the right hand of God, is pleading your case to tell God how special you are and that you're one of his special children. And then I want to jump over to the book of Hebrews. I love the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, uh, the writer picks up this idea of running a race. And this is not a sprint. This is a marathon, a long race. Our Christian walk with God is like a long, long race. What's the furthest you've ever run? Some of you just run around the block is is, is enough. One time I ran the mini marathon. I ran, whatever that is, 13.2 miles. Whew, that was a long run. I did it one time. That's all. I ran the mini marathon one time. That was a lot of running. And that's what our Christian life is like. It's a long race from the time we accept Christ until the time we go home to be with God. And then forever, it never ends. Paul says this. So then, with endurance, let us run the race that is laid out in front of us. Since we have a great cloud of witnesses that surround us. And let us throw off any extra baggage we have and get rid of the sin that trips us up. And fix our eyes on Jesus. Faith's pioneer and perfecter, he endured the cross, ignoring the shame for the sake of the joy that was set out in front of him, and then sat down at the right hand of God's throne. So we say, well, what is Jesus? Where is Jesus? He's at the right hand of God. What's he doing there? Just chilling? No, he's pleading our case. He's saying, God, he they're one of us. That's one of your children. That's one of the people that I died for. And he's also waiting for you. He's like in a crowd, like if if you've ever been to a track meet 
or you've ever been to a cross country meet and all those people gather around at the finish line waiting for those runners to come in. That's what Jesus is doing. He's at the right hand of God, pleading your case, and he's waiting for you to finish your race. Each and every one of us, our races are different. My walk with God, my race for God is different than yours. I'm at a different place for you, and I have a different family in a different situation. Everybody's running their race as best they can. Jesus is pleading your case. He's cheering you on, and he's waiting for you. And the writer of Hebrews says, put your eyes on Jesus. He's the one that's out there in front. Follow him until the very end. So boys and girls, there's my answer to the question. Where is Jesus now? He's back from the dead. He's ascended, remember, went up into heaven, and he's at the right hand of God, and he's pleading your case, and he's waiting for you. I'm so thankful to know that Jesus is alive and active and pleading for us and waiting for us. Well, God bless you. I'll talk to you next week.